solutions and the, what we discuss is when you're faced with looking at uh, trying to, you're given some charge distribution you want to find the fields or the potentials associated with that um, want us to think a little bit about the best approach to doing that uh, as we discussed there is a general formal solution that relates um, the charge distribution to the potential, but depending upon the symmetry of the problem, you might want to approach the problem sort of through the back door by first using Gauss's law to get the field and then using uh, the integral of the field to get the potential. Or you if you if that doesn't if it's not if you can't use Gauss's law, well to get the field you would find the potential and take the gradient to get the field. You have to think about what's the best approach for doing that. Um, okay, so that's uh, the general kinds of problems that we're faced with. Um, quite often, we're looking at circumstances where we won't necessarily specify just the charges, but um, we will specify that there are some conducting materials around. Of course, if we knew what all the charges were in that material, well, then in principle, that solution is here. But in practice, we don't necessarily know that. And in fact, that may not be the most efficient thing to do. Um, we'll look at a remind you of a particular example of that in a moment. So the conductors, uh, we're thinking about them as perfect conductors, and many materials, uh, metals, are, are well approximated by perfect conductors, ideal conductors. And some of the important properties that we discussed, that we mentioned last time, is that the electric field inside the bulk of a conductor in electrostatics is zero. And whatever free charges there are, uh, must, if there are any, they reside at the surfaces. And those surfaces are equipotential surfaces. OK? So um, what that means is that quite often the problems, I mean, the, the chapters two and three of Jackson are all about solving for the electrostatic potential in the presence of conducting boundary conditions. It's often a problem we care about from practical considerations. So formally speaking, we can solve that problem by saying, well, the general problem is the Poisson equation. And we want to look for solutions to Poisson equations that now that include both the particular solution and the homogeneous solution. So now that Green's function is more general, um, where the function f here is a solution to Laplace's equation. And it's chosen in such a way that the boundary conditions set by uh, typically conducting surfaces are satisfied. Because we said conducting surfaces define uh, our equipotential surfaces. So the general solution, formally speaking, is of this form involving the convolution of the source if there are three charges other than the ones that are part of the conductor um, with the, this Green's function. And that function, again, f again, will depend on the geometry of the boundaries. And then, a, a generally, a surface term. Okay? And if we have no sources, we only have the, um, the 
potentials and surface charges on the conductors, and this term is zero. And then we have the standard kind of boundary condition whereby one specifies either the potential everywhere on the surface, so-called Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, or in other places, uh, we specify the normal derivative of the potential on the surface. And by uh, some manipulation, one can show that the solution to Laplace's equation is uniquely specified. That is to say, there is one and only one solution which can satisfy those boundary conditions. So specifying the boundary conditions alone specifies this in the absence of sources. And if we have sources, then we add this term as well. OK? So let me remind you, yeah, please. Isn't a boundary condition something must be least from the district and Norman? That's right. These are the Neumann, I'm sorry. These are the, the Dirichlet boundary conditions. If you specify the um, potential everywhere, the Neumann boundary conditions are if you specify the normal derivative everywhere. And then mixed boundary conditions, if in some regions you specify potential, and some places you specify. It has a different name here? No. Oh, okay. I said these are the Dirichlet. Okay. Um, I just forgot to say these are the Neumann. Right? I mean, if, if I specify this everywhere, I can't specify both. That actually, I, there's no, I can have a conflicting solution if I have both. I can have in some regions the potential in some regions normal derivative, but I can't specify both those things and have a unique solution. All right. So an example, a simple example that I'm sure you've all seen is the problem of Looking at, for example, suppose I have as uh, the problem, I have a circumstance where I have an infinite conducting plane that's grounding, and above it I have some charge density. Okay? And I want to specify, let's say this is the plane z equals 0. And I want to specify the potential everywhere for above the plane. OK? How would you do it? Image charges. Image charges, right? Because, well, the point here is that what's going to happen, of course, is if say this is positive charge, I'm going to attract. There's going to be some, uh, you know, negative charges that are going to be attracted to where the positive charges are, and positive charges on the away from, repelled from these guys. There's some surface charge distribution. If we knew all those charges, well, then we could, you know, just integrate and find it. But that's generally not what we would do because it, it's, it's, it's a waste. It's, we could figure it out, actually. But it's, we can write down a solution almost instantaneously, as was suggested, based on the method of images because of the uniqueness property of the solution to the Laplace equation. If we find any solution that satisfies the boundary conditions, well, that is the solution. Okay. And we can guess that solution just by the uh, symmetry of the problem and our deep knowledge and understanding of the nature of these potentials. So, of course, when I, here I had a general charge distribution. What I want to look at is the solution for a, a point charge. And then once I have a point charge, I can convolve the solution of a point charge with the, distri the general distribution to get the complete solution, OK? Of course, I would, if this potential wasn't grounded but sent to some other thing, well, then I would have this term as well. But the surface term is 0 here because the potential is 0. And, the, and uh, the, um, so let's, let's do the problem. 
So method of images is a wonderful trick when it works. It's kind of like Gauss's law. If you could use it, use it. But very rare that you can use it. But this is an example, meaning that we could just guess the solution. So here's my, uh, let's put this, let's call this the, oh, it doesn't really matter, the x-axis. Uh, here's the charge, point charge. Here's my conducting plane. And I want to find, write down what is the solution for the point charge. If I know what the solution for a point charge is, then I know the solution for an arbitrary distribution because I just combined that. So what's the solution? Well, the solution has to be something which satisfies the boundary conditions and satisfies the fact that there's a point charge here. And we can write that instantly if this is a distance d above the plane, we seek a solution with the potential uh, at z equals 0 as a function of x and y is 0. And point charge at x equals, what do I call it, d. Well, um, the point charge q. Uh, if I put a equal and opposite charge, charge minus q, below the plane, then the um, field produced by this image charge above the plane is exactly the same as all these negative charges on the surface. Because the combination of these two things make, is, makes a field that is normal oops, it's negative charge, positive charge to the surface. And as long as I produce a field that's normal to the surface, that's the solution. So it's, it's not the solution below here, because below here there actually isn't any charge. But this point charge below the conducting plane mocks up. It produces exactly the same field above the plane as all the induced surface charges do. That's the point. Yes? So what would be the solution below uh, negative D? Would that be like a whole scene from edge? Um, it's, a, it's a much more complex solution. In this case, I mean, the, the potential we know in this case, below here, there is no field. So what's happening here is that below, the induced surface charges combined with here are making no field, right? Because I can make, put a field at infinity here. The potential is zero here, the potential is zero here. Therefore, the solution is potential is zero everywhere. That uniquely satisfies the boundary conditions. Of course, that's like a Faraday cage, right? If you want to shield yourself from uh, electric fields, go behind the conducting cage. It's a good place to hang out in a thunderstorm. Uh, so, but above, this is the solution. And here it is. And the, therefore, we know what the potential is for z greater than 0. The potential, which is not a vector, but that's a vector, is equal to um, q. So I'm going to set this to be a unit point charge. So I'll set q equal to 1, x minus d d sub x squared minus x minus minus x squared, or 1 minus 
x minus b squared plus y squared plus z squared square root minus x plus b squared plus y squared plus z. And this is thus the Green's function for the um, point charge, in this case, at position uh, D in the X direction. Now, if I wanted to write down the general Green's function, I would just make this an arbitrary point, X prime. Sorry? That's potential. And why is there a square? Because uh, it's supposed to be there. Excuse me. So, um, this is a case where you could just write down the Green's function. And then I would write, and the general Green's function. And then I would just convolve this. Yeah, my plane here is not at z equal to zero, it's at x equal to zero. I apologize, I changed my coordinate system. All right. So, you know, you get glance just for memory and uh, a little bit of exposure. Glance at chapter two and three of Jackson. Look at the Green's function for a conductive sphere. For example, uh, or a charged ring or something. Just get a sense of what the things are like. All right. All right. So one last. Uh, thing I wanted to discuss in relation to thinking about conductors is just to remind you quickly about the notion of capacitance. And uh, so the notion of capacitance is the following. If I have some conducting surface, maybe I have this, another conducting surface somewhere, and I uh, put a battery with a potential difference between them, then what we know is that a charge will build up on each of these conducting surfaces. In order such that the potential difference between these two conducting surfaces is V, each one being an equipotential surface, because that's what we said. The surface of conductor is an equipotential surface <coughs> in electrostatics. Okay? And um, the capacitance is defined such that the charge, the equal and opposite charges that build up on these the mutual capacitance to like, uh, between these two conducting surfaces is proportional to the voltage by a quantity C. And this is the capacitance is, a, is purely geometric. 
assuming in this case that we have vacuum and in between them and this is a perfect conductor. So the capacitance is a property of the geometry of the conductors and the geometry alone. Um, so, how do you calculate capacitance? Empirically, or you can measure it. Yeah. yeah. And but if you did, if you couldn't measure it, or you know, you're not given the actual apparatus. You're given you want to know what you expect. You expect how would you calculate the capacitance? From the distribution. Sorry. From the potential distribution. From the potential, but what you're given here is. Uh, that you, if you make a potential difference between these two conductors, then they will be charged. So how are you going to calculate what that potential difference is? Well, the problem is generally complicated. I mean, what we can do is we can solve, I mean, as, as Boyan was suggesting, we can solve this problem from given what the that what the potential surfaces are, and there's no other free charges other than the ones on the surface, then we can solve Laplace's equation. If we know Laplace's equation, then we solve the potential, and then the normal derivatives to whatever potential we get must be related to surface charge density from the boundary conditions that we have. Remember, the field is zero inside the bulk and it's got, you know, this field outside, the discontinuity in the normal derivative is related to the surface structure. So we could do that. Now, we rarely actually do that. Um, there's a few problems where we can uh, calculate it because we have very symmetric circumstances. And, you know, we go around that triangle in a different way. So often, when we're calculating capacitance, we're doing it because the system is so symmetric that we can just write down using Gauss's law. So uh, typically, we find capacitance uh, when there is uh, symmetry. So, for example, the, the canonical example is the parallel plate. So in the parallel plate, we have two conducting planes, which are plates, which look kind of parallel. Um, and we catch our uh, battery to it and create a potential difference. And we want to find the capacitance. Well, what do we know? What we know is because of this problem, we know that this is an equipotential surface. But we know from the symmetry that the charge distribution that creates that equipotential surface is one if the charge is uniform. Because we know uh, that a uniform uh, sigma, surface charge density, is one which produces, in, for an infinite plane, a uniform potential on that plane. Because we've studied the problem of what potential is created by an infinite plane. So we know that what's going to happen in this case is that I'm going to get Q to the degree to which we treat this as approximately infinite. I mean, we'll get Q, but it'll be uniform with a uniform uh, surface charge density here and minus Q there. Now, it's not exactly true because of the fact that there are edge effects, but it's a good approximation, and as you're seeing, in your homework, as long as the distance between these plates is tiny compared to the size of the plates, well then, that's a good approximation. Okay? 
So what one does to calculate capacity of these problems is one puts uniform charge. If you can, if you know from the symmetry that the surface which is equipotential is the surface with uniform charge density, you put that uniform charge density down on the surface. And then you calculate the potential. And then the ratio between them is the capacitance. So now I ask you, what is, suppose I didn't have the boundary here and I just had two parallel plates with equal and opposite charge uniformly distributed on those planes. Each plane uh, has an area A and the distance between the planes is D. What is the potential difference between those two planes? Yeah? Well, I mean, you can just you know, figure out what the charge density is, and then that tells you what the electric field is, and then you just integrate from it. Exactly. So in these systems where we have high symmetry, we use Gauss's law to determine the electric field from the given charge distribution, and then we integrate over a distance to get the potential. So what is the electric field associated with this parallel plate charge distribution? Uh, maybe there's a 4 pi in there, right? We remember, right, if we looked at a single plate, if this had a charge distribution with a charge per unit area Q over A, and I make the little pillbox, which has a little, you know, little A, and therefore I have uh, the flux integral E dot dA is going to be equal to 2 E in the normal direction times A is 4 pi times the charge enclosed which is equal to 4 pi times uh, the little a times the charge, right? That's the charge enclosed, so that the electric field from a single plate is 2 pi q over a, or 2 pi c. And if I have the equal and opposite guy over here, then it adds in between and the outside goes to zero to the degree to which fringe fields are negligible, right? So inside a parallel plate capacitor, the electric field is two times this, or four pi Q ray. Uniform. So what is the potential difference between those two plates? Well, it's the integral of E dot DL, but E is constant, so it's just E times the distance between the plates. I mean, that's something we, we don't, we shouldn't forget the most basic facts. We forget it. Oh my God, there's some Laplacian, I got a Green's function. No, I mean, the, the electric field is volts per unit distance. Okay? So. Uh, and that's, um, oh no, we want the other thing with volt, right? So this is then equal to uh, 4 pi d over a times q. And um, the voltage is equal to q over the capacitance. So the capacitance of a parallel plate is the area divided by 4 pi d. Purely geometric. Now, if in SI units, 1 over 4 pi is epsilon naught. Um, so 
often as um, in SI units, epsilon naught, the units of SI of capacitance in SI units are farads. So epsilon naught is often given in terms of farads per meter. But um, in the beautiful sense, capacitance has the units of geometry, because that's all it is. So capacitance in, in CGS units is units of centimeters, saying something about the ratio between the area of the capacitor to the distance between them. All right. Um, now, of course, a capacitor stores electromet electrostatic energy, right? Because there is work done by the battery in moving charge uh, between the conductors, right? So the work, if I have the parallel plate capacitor, As I'm charging it up, moving charge, and if I move a little bit of PQ onto the, the plate, moving it from the other plate, then we know the work done is whatever the potential difference, it has to move it against whatever potential difference there is. <coughs> and that potential difference, if there's a particular amount of charge already on there, um, is equal to uh, Q over C. So if I were to integrate this to the final charge, Now, of course, that work that we've done, as we discussed, that energy can be thought to be residing in the field. So this should be equal to the total integral over all space of the created electric field, or A pi. Let's check that. Um, well, the electric field is zero everywhere except inside my tasty ice cream sandwich. Um, so my electric field is uniform, so I could just write it down as the electric field um, is 4 pi q over a squared times the volume, oh, this is over a pi, times the volume, and the volume is A times D. Okay, so that's then equal to, um, well, this is going, I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but we did it, I did this way. 2 pi Q squared over A times D. Right? Um, and we said so Q squared is equal to, shouldn't have done this in slightly different way, but oh well. Q is equal to C times B. C squared B squared over A times B or where? Oh, yeah, 16. That helps. Thank you. Uh, 
Oh, wait, no. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, because there's a half here. Yeah. So it's going to work. Um, right. So that's what we got. Let's plug in for C. C. So we got 2 pi uh, C B squared. This is a mess. This is a stupid way to do it, but I did it. And the, the capacitance we said was A over 4 pi D which is equal to times d, which is going to have cd squared. That's the work. There's better ways to check that. Uh, but indeed, the work done in moving the charge is equivalent to the energy stored in the electric field. All right. Okay, um, so, uh, as we said, there are many, when we're dealing with problems of electrostatics, uh, we have this whole bunch of methodologies, the methods of images, the method of uh, boundary conditions. What I'm going to concentrate on, because it's going to be very important for us in uh, building our foundation for thinking about electrodynamics and radiation is looking at the problem where we have uh, approximate solutions for localized charge distributions. without conducting that boundaries. Okay? So the problem I want to look at, the general problem I want to look at is, suppose I have some distribution of charge, whatever it is, and we have some point of observation. Okay. And 
it's uniformly distributed along that ring uh, of radius A. And I want to find, say, the potential at some distance away. Now, let's say I'm on the z-axis. Let's call the z-axis the axis of symmetry. Well, we know an exact form, in this case, at least on the on-axis, we can write down an exact solution for this, right? Because every point on this ring is the same distance from the point of observation. So the potential on axis is Q over that distance. And that distance is equal to the square root of Z squared plus A squared. And if I were to integrate it as a little DQ, I would just get every point contributing the same, because they're all the same distance from the point of observation. So that's the exact solution. <laughs> now, in this far field limit that we're considering, we're looking at the case where z is much, much bigger than the size of the distribution. In that case, we can do a Taylor series expression <coughs> of this, as we've done before. So the uh, potential on the z axis <coughs> here. Um, is Q over Z. Now let's write down, let's write this down, Q over Z times 1 plus A squared over Z squared to the minus 1 half power. Where the small parameter here is the ratio of A to the distance of the point of observation. So we can do a lowest order binomial expansion. Write this one minus one half a squared over z squared or <coughs> q over z minus q a squared over two z cubed plus dot dot dot. Okay. So the lowest order, what we see is the expected term, the potential, is just the potential of a point charge if the distance along the z-axis is much bigger than the radius of this ring, then we can't see that geometry, and it looks like a point charge with total charge Q. But then there are correction terms, which we're going to study their properties in more detail. In fact, this is a quadrupole correction to the monopole dominant part of this distribution. Okay? Another example. Suppose I have point charges of equal and opposite magnitude. Okay? Let's put the origin for ease halfway in between. And there's some point of observation x. Um, and so now the question is, what is the potential associated with these two point charges to lowest order? Well, you might say it's the, you know, far enough away, it looks like the potential of a point charge. But the total charge here is zero. So that vanishes. In fact, we can look at this if, so this is my script R plus, and this is my script e r minus, then the potential in this case is q over the magnitude of script e r uh, plus minus, let's see, this is the exact potential. But we want to look at this in the 
uh, limit if I call the distance between the two charges D that the point of observation is much, much bigger than this separation distance D. Well, we can do that kind of instantly here. This is like, you know, the diffraction, double slit diffraction problem that you solve in freshman physics. If this is far enough away, then these look effectively parallel to one another. And then the distance between them, the difference between these distances is just this little piece, right? If I write this as Q, this the length R plus minus the length R minus divided by R plus times R minus. This difference in those path planes is this. And if I call this angle theta, then this is the cosine of theta. Or d sine theta. Uh, so this and is equal to Q times D sine theta divided by these guys are about the same R squared, where R is equal to the distance of the point of operation approximately. Okay? So in this case, when we had no net charge, then what we see here is that the potential doesn't fall off like 1 over r at large distances. It falls off like 1 over r squared. It falls off more rapidly. In this case, the dominant term falls off like 1 over the distance of the distribution because there was net charge. And then if I have a net charge, then it looks like a point charge. That's the dominant term. Uh, and it falls off like 1 over the distance. But here the net charge is 0, and what we see is we get the potential falling off like 1 over r squared. This, of course, you recognize as an electric dipole. Um, all right. So we want to uh, characterize these things. Oh, yeah, there's one other exa last example. So let's now suppose I have the following charge. Suppose I have two dipoles but those dipoles are oppositely oriented. Okay? So let's just make a coordinate system here. Put the origin here. Let's So they're on a square with the plus and minus charges distributed on the corners of the sphere that way. Okay? So in this case, the potential, the exact potential, well, I have charge number one, x minus v squared plus y minus v squared plus z squared. It's in, the, it's in the z equals zero plane. And then I have this charge, which is minus q. And then I have x minus v squared plus y plus v squared plus z squared. And then, you know, the other two terms. So this is just writing down the exact potential. And we can do the same Taylor's expansion, which I won't bore you with, uh, 
for if my uh, distance r is much, much bigger than d, then what we find is that the potential as a function of x, y, and z is equal to rho, bless you, q d squared times the x coordinate of observation, the y coordinate of observation over r to the fifth plus dot, dot, dot. And if I wanted to write this in spherical coordinates, which I want to, x is equal to r sine theta cosine phi, y is r sine theta sine phi. This is then equal to um, sine squared theta. sine phi cos phi divided by r cubed. Okay? So, what we see in this case is that this distribution has no net charge, so there's no 1 over r term. It also has no net dipole moment, as we will remind ourselves. You can kind of see that because <coughs> two dipoles that are oriented that cancel one another. So the lowest non-vanishing term has a potential that falls off like 1 over r cubed. It's not isotropic. It, remember, theta, r theta and phi here are the coordinates of the point of observation. This is saying something about how the charge is distributed in space, or charges. And this dependence is characteristic of what we call a quadrupole potential. <coughs> so what we're going to talk about today and for the next few lectures is this whole problem of multiple moments in other factors. Okay, to do so, uh, let's return to the general expression for potential for arbitrary charge distribution with no other boundary conditions and no charges at infinity so that we can get infinitely far away in some limit or very, very far away from the charge distribution. Okay, so I'm going to draw the picture again. Here's the charge distribution. Here's some particular point within the charge distribution. Here's the point of observation. And we have some distance, script R, between the point of observation and the point of the source. Okay? And we have the general expression for the potential. And our goal is to find some kind of general expansion, not some specific expansion that we had there for the Taylor's expansion, which shows a dominant monopole term, and then a next order dipole term, and then a next order quadrupole term, and then a next order octopole term, etc., etc. No sextuple. Um, it's all two to the two to the pole. <laughs> All right, so um, how are we going to do that? 
Well, when we look at this expression, this is where we have some comparison between the point of observation and the point of the source. And we are integrating that over a distribution which is localized in such a way that it, we're going to look at this for regions where x prime is small in magnitude compared to the magnitude of x. Okay, So r prime is equal to the magnitude of x prime is going to be much, much smaller than r, which is the magnitude of x, for all r prime at some Okay, so we're looking in this level. So let's, this is going to be a little bit of tedium, maybe a lot of tedium, let's see how it goes. Um, so let's do a little aside over here. Uh, let's take a look at the green function. 